Today uh, begins chapter 2 uh, in the book of Colossians, in Paul's letter to the Colossian church. And before we get any further, guys, I really will just want to pray. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, it's you. Just like it said in that song, Lord, it's you. It always was you, it's you now, and it always will be you. God, uh, we just thank you so much, Lord, uh, for blessing us with uh, the things we do have, God, and... Um, for blessing us with your word, and I just pray that uh, this, this message uh, glorifies you and, and helps us learn about you, Lord. Um, God, we thank you for these things, and uh, just speak to us, Lord, and just rip open our hearts and, and just minister to us, Lord. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I don't know if you guys have read Ephesians. I'm sure you have the book of Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians and Colossians are very similar they're very similar in style, but really there's two differences in them. The book of Ephesians is actually, it's about our identity in Christ. Our identity and how that should play out in our lives. Well, Colossians is about Jesus' identity. It's about Jesus' identity and how that should play out in our lives. So as you read Colossians, you can't help but notice all the emphasis on who Jesus is. Can you see that so far? Have you seen that? In chapter 1, who Jesus is and what it means for us. I want to give you guys just a quick spotlight on where we've been uh, on a, a couple of verses. And we're going to see what we've seen so far uh, in Colossians in chapter 1, up there on the screen. you got chapter 1, verse 14. What's it say? In whom we have redemption. He's talking about Jesus. Verse 19, in him all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Verse 16, in him all things were created. Chapter 1, 22, reconciled in his body of flesh. Guys, can you give me an in him? In him. Amen. Thank you. That's what Colossians is all about. In him. We're going to see it again in today's text, and there's about a dozen or more times all throughout Colossians where you see Paul talking about in him. It's in Jesus where everything is. So we're going to learn that again today. I'm calling this sermon today Relationship Goals. Hashtag Relationship Goals. I'm jumping on the hashtag train that Ezra started last week. <laughs> we're just going to start hashtagging all our sermon titles. No, hashtag relationship goals. As controversy, controversy is swirling in the Colossian church, and there's false doctrines that are being spread in the church. Now, I love how in Colossians, if you pay careful attention, Paul doesn't give those, do those false doctrines much breath. Rather, he emphasizes and devotes his energy to truth. To truth. So Paul encourages them in the truth of Jesus and his identity, and for them and us to remain steadfast and committed to him and living out the gospel in our lives. So in light of the controversy, Paul has three goals. He's got three goals for, for them and us in our relationship with Jesus, relationship goals. And they directly have an effect on our relationships with each other. So what we're going to do is we're going to read the text we're going to read the text. I'm going to continue to develop the context a little bit behind the text, and then we're going to unpack the scripture and talk about these three goals that Paul has for the Colossian church and for us. So let's read the text. It's up there, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Verses 2, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, it says this. This is what God's word says. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love 
to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order in the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, in him, rooted and built up in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Guys, let's develop the context just a little bit more. There's a false doctrine. You see that language Paul uses there? Plausible argument. Don't be deluded by these plausible arguments. This plausible argument, first of all, a plausible argument is, it's an argument that sounds good. It sounds good, but it's actually meant to deceive. It's meant to deceive, and we see that a lot today in things. I want to actually imitate Paul, though. I want to imitate Paul and not give the heresy too much breath. Rather, I want to focus on truth, on the truth of Jesus. But we can't understand this text without really understanding the context behind it. So we got to talk about the heresy just a little bit, the false doctrine just a little bit. This false doctrine going around in that church right now is called Gnosticism. Gnosticism. Gnosticism holds that there's like this hidden, secret, mystical intellectual knowledge that connects us to God, that connects us to God. The Gnostics thought that knowledge was superior to faith. Knowledge was superior to faith. Now, this would resonate with people back then in the Roman Empire. This would resonate with them because there was a pervading interest in mystical and philosophical thought. There was a pervading interest in that. Much like today, much like today, people were always grabbing on to the latest and greatest. They were always grabbing on to the next best philosophical nugget that they could get about life and the things of God. Much like today, Paul knows that these plausible arguments can pull them away from living out the gospel, from living out the gospel in their lives. Guys, I call this stuff that we see today clickbait. You guys know what clickbait is online? Man, you get these little thumbnails on, on the internet, on websites, and they say something, and then you click into it, and it's not really at all what they said it was going to be. They just wanted you to click in there and see whatever it is they got going. Man, when I did that I, uh, several times, I just don't do it anymore. Man, I don't click on that stuff. It's garbage. Guys, this is, it's, it's clickbait today. There's belief systems out there. There's belief systems out there that they will give you Jesus. Yep, Jesus was crucified. He died on the cross. Great, but he's not God. But he's not God. It sounds good and all that, but what they're saying is false. So basically you're telling me that, okay, Jesus was crucified and his sacrifice was sufficient for the forgiveness of our sin, but you're telling me he's not God? Well, that means, what that means is that you have a low view of sin. That it wasn't God that was required to be crucified to, for, for the forgiveness of our sin. That means you have a low view of your sin, and if you have a low view of your sin, you have a low view of God's grace. A low view of God's grace. Don't buy into that. Don't buy into that. There's also little strands of thought, man. It's all over social media, philosophies and little things on social media that can derail you. Don't let that stuff derail you. Paul wanted them to know, and us, that real wisdom wasn't hidden in secret. It wasn't hidden in secret, but deposited in Jesus Christ. Deposited in Jesus Christ so that everybody can access it. It's accessible to everybody. A relationship with God through Christ is a relationship of increasing solidarity and the accessibility of gospel truth. So the goals of Paul and the marks of this increasing solidarity are played out in our hearts. They're played out in our hearts. And it's an inside job. 
It's not an outside job. It's an inside job. It's in our hearts. So in his offense against the heresy of the day, Paul takes aim at our hearts. He doesn't take aim at the heresy, really. He takes aim at our hearts. And he shares these three goals that he has for the church. And they're up there on the screen. These three goals. Our hearts are encouraged. That our hearts are encouraged. That our hearts are knitted together in love. And that our hearts are reaching. Our hearts are reaching and experiencing the full assurance of the wisdom and knowledge in Jesus Christ. But guys, all these goals, they hinge They hinge on rooting and building ourselves up and establishing ourselves and establishing our faith as individuals and as a church in Jesus Christ. Let's talk about these goals. Let's go back to the text up there on the screen. Let's talk about these goals. The first one, our hearts are encouraged. Now guys, this isn't any type of encouragement like the, you can do it. You can do it, just put your mind to it. It's not that kind of encouragement. It's not that kind. Guys, the word for encouragement that Paul uses here is a very similar word that Jesus used when he was referring to the Holy Spirit. To the Holy Spirit. This is Holy Spirit-empowered encouragement, deep and rooted in the heart. It's encouragement that leads to a settled confidence in Jesus Christ. This encouragement is only from Jesus. It's only from Jesus through the Holy Spirit in each one of us and pouring out into each other. Pouring out into each other. Paul can't be with them. He, Paul can't be there with them, right? We see that in the text. He can't be there with them. It's like he's saying, because of your gospel foundation, you have somebody better than me. You have somebody better than me. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate helper, the ultimate comforter, the encourager, far greater than any encouragement I could give you or anybody could give you. It's encouragement from Christ through the Holy Spirit. Guys, I experienced this in this church, man. When my wife and I had our daughter two years ago, man, the hospitality ministry, for like two weeks, we just got people coming over and bringing meals to our house night after night, knocking on our door. Hey, we got a meal for you. (laughs) Guys, it was awesome. Do you have any idea how encouraging that is and how much that actually moved my needle in my faith, in my faith in Christ and in my faith in the body of Christ, the church? Now, guys, anybody can do that. Anybody can just give a meal to somebody That's nothing, you know, anybody can do that. The difference is the Holy Spirit working inside those people in the church, blessing us and encouraging us. And that moved our needle. Now in turn, I just want to move your needle. I want to return that favor. I want to encourage you guys just like you've encouraged me. And that's just only one example of how y'all encourage me. It's not just the hospitality ministry. Guys, it's not just here in this body, but when we go home and we take the church with us, the Holy Spirit is just not like in this building and then when we leave, it stays here. No, the Holy Spirit is in us. So we take the church with us home into our marriages, into our families, into our neighborhoods. Guys, we experience this encouragement first through genuine faith, then then a personal time in God's word and they're through different forms of discipleship in our lives. Small groups, small groups, one-on-one discipleship. Guys, this is what it's all about, is encouraging each other in Christ. But it all hinges on our focus on the gospel. Our focus on the gospel. Anybody can meet as a small group. Anybody can do that. But what are we focusing on? What are we focusing on? Any group of 100 or 200 people can just meet in a building and call itself a church. Anybody can do that. What are you focusing on? That's the difference. Are we focusing on Jesus? Are we focusing on the gospel? And are we living that out in our lives? It bears asking, 
where are you going for encouragement? Because you already got it in you. Through genuine faith in Christ, you've got the encouragement in you through the Holy Spirit. Guys, as Christians, we have to ask ourselves this because it's easy to get derailed. There's nothing wrong with watching Dr. Phil. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing... I've watched Dr. Phil before. I admit it. I have. But are you going to him? Are you relying on him for your deep need for spiritual encouragement? Because if you are, you're in trouble. If you are, you're in trouble. Guys, lasting, redemptive, kingdom-building encouragement is always going to be the Holy Spirit working through his people, the church. The church. Guys, what's the second goal? Paul's second goal here. That first one, our hearts are encouraged. Our hearts are encouraged. Now, our hearts are knitted together in love. Guys, this isn't any kind of love. You got to look deeper. This isn't romantic, sentimental, friendly, or brotherly love. This isn't like, dude, I love you, man. Yeah, I love you. That's not what this is. The word for love Paul used here is the same word Jesus used when speaking of his love. His love, agape. The love of God in Christ. It's unmerited faithfulness, undeserved commitment, demonstrative, sacrificial love that we see completely on the cross. This kind of love is more than mere words. It's more than mere words. Because words are good and they have their place, but mere words are incomplete. They're incomplete. It's not a love that shows itself really in how it feels or what it says. Ultimately, it shows itself in what it does. In what it does. It's a love that is active. It's active love. Jesus spoke a lot of words. Man, you read the Gospels. He said a lot of things. But ultimately, he showed us his demonstrative love and what he did on the cross. That's the love that he's talking about. That's the love that Paul is talking about here. And that's the love that we need to be knitting ourselves together in. In Christ, we increasingly experience this unifying, impenetrable, demonstrative, sacrificial love. I recently was learning about bulletproof vests. I have no idea why. Don't ask me. <laughs> I, I, you know, you just learn things. Google's cool for a lot of things. Bulletproof vest, guys. Kevlar is like this special plastic cloth. Okay. Now, among its many different properties, it's this plastic cloth. And if you put a microscope up to this plastic cloth, guys, this thread is so tightly woven together. It is so tightly woven together, it's one of the reasons why a bullet can't penetrate that vest. Guys, you look at this awesome old navy shirt. Man, it looks good. It looks like it's knitted pretty tightly, does it not? Guys, you put a microscope on this thing, this thing is not knitted tightly at all. You could put a spoon through this. <laughs> Guys, that's the love. That is the love. The love of God in Christ. That's what we need to be knitting ourselves together in. And nothing else. It's impenetrable. Nothing can break through it. It bears asking, what are we knitting ourselves to? What are we knitting ourselves to? If it's anything or anybody but the love of God and Christ, it's incomplete love. Don't get me wrong, that, you know, it, it's got properties of love, but it's incomplete. It's incomplete love. It's possible to love and not be a Christian. That's possible. Guys, there's a lot of non-believers that, man, they're more loving than Christians. <laughs> Let's be honest about that. It's true. There are more, there are actually non-believers that are more loving than Christian. But ultimately, it's a love that is incomplete without the Holy Spirit. It isn't lasting. It isn't redemptive. It isn't kingdom-building love. 
So what are we knitting ourselves to together? As a church, we are called to be knitting ourselves together in the love of God in Christ and pursuing that love through a relationship with Jesus. Because what's the third goal? The third goal, our hearts are reaching all the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Our hearts are reaching. They're reaching. This isn't intellectual assurance. This isn't intellectual understanding or or knowledge. This is concrete, settled assurance in our heart. This rich and full assurance can only be found as we experience Jesus and his gospel in our lives. When we're walking in faith, immersing ourselves in his word, we're being obedient to his commands, and we're growing in grace, assurance becomes fuller and fuller and fuller. Knowing God isn't some complicated equation. It's not some complicated equation of mysterious and secret knowledge. Guys, It's simple faith in Christ. That's where it starts. So it bears asking, what are we reaching for? At some point in our lives, man, everybody, and everybody on earth, at some point in our lives, we start asking deeper questions about life and about God. We have this tendency in us to think that there's more than the gospel. Do we not? We have this tendency to think that there's more than the gospel, so we jump from one philosophy or belief to another. Okay, I got that. Okay, I'm going to store that in my mind. I'm going to go to this next one and just learn about that. And then as we move and go from one thing to another and just keep consuming and consuming and consuming, we feel like we're reaching some level of heightened awareness, some level of heightened awareness and enlightenment. Do we not? We do this. Paul wants us to know that everything we need to know is found in Jesus Christ. Paul wants to know Christ in relationship. So God, guys, if we're asking, man, if there's a God, what is God like? If there's a God, what's he like? Well, you read the scriptures. What does Jesus say? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said that. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's wisdom. There's no mystery. There's no mystery about it. Guys, if God exists, oh, what does God think of me? What does God think of me? Read the scriptures. Pay attention to how Jesus approaches broken people. Pay attention to how he talks to them. Pay attention to how he, he, he cuddles up on them and touches them and, and holds them or, or whatever. Pay attention to those things in the Gospels. To how he approaches and deals with people. If you want to know what he thinks about you, look there. Guys, if if there's a God, what does God think of the world? What does he think of the world? Read the scriptures. Maybe John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever should believe in him will have eternal life. Man, if there's God, what does, what does God want me to do? Guys, every question I'm asking here, we ask these questions. What does God want me to do? Read the scriptures. And start with obeying Jesus' commands. Start with obeying Jesus' commands. It's no mystery. It's all laid out right in front of us. And that's what Paul is trying to help us understand. Jesus came to pull the curtain away. God is no longer a mystery. In Jesus and his gospel, we can know God, and it is no mystery. It is accessible to all of us, to everybody. Guys, I want to mention some concluding things here. Paul's goals are aimed at the heart. Why? I believe he aims for our hearts and not really the heresy or the false doctrines for a reason. Guys, Satan's battlefield is in our minds. It's in our minds. Our minds can be diluted. Our minds can be diluted by all the competing false beliefs out there. But hearts, hearts growing in these goals cannot be diluted. 
He's trying to build a fortress in our hearts. That's where our soul is in our, in our being. Guys, when our hearts are rooted and built up in him and established and firm in the faith, then we are growing in these goals. Satan's Jedi mind tricks, they have no match for Jesus settling in our hearts and an assurance and confidence growing in our hearts. His mind tricks are no match for that. Guys, so it bears asking, what are we standing on? What are we standing on? Man, when my daughter first started walking, you know, she starts walking in the house, so it's like completely level, obviously, there in the house. And, you know, hey, I got this. Awesome. Yeah, I'm walking. Great. You know, we're excited about it. And then the first time, I remember we, we brought her outside. We have kind of a steep driveway, and there's little, you know, things here and there. And she's like, whoa, this is new. This is new. Like, I thought I could walk. And she's falling and scraping her knees and her elbows Guys, we're living, some of us are living our lives that way. We're allowing ourselves to stand on this uneven ground and we're just going through life, just, just falling and tripping and getting pushed around. Guys, are we rooting ourselves in Christ and building ourselves in Him? Our lives and choices reflect the ground that we're standing on. They reflect the ground that we're standing on. Ground determines everything in our lives. How we view the world, the things that happen, how we interpret all the information coming at us, all these arguments, all these plausible arguments. Jesus is a foundation of rock, a level foundation of rock in which all of God's treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found, and they're not hidden. They're there to be found. Guys, we live in a culture, and it's, it's always been this way. We live in a culture where, you know, we, we set our sights on point D, right? On point D. And then the way to get there is by accomplishing our way, by accomplishing our way there through B and C, points B and C, which are normally totally disconnected from point D. You know, okay, point D, I got to do this, and I got to do this to get there. Right? We do that. That's true for a lot of things in life. My favorite coffee, in case you're wondering if you want to buy me a gift card or something. <laughs> my favorite coffee is decaf, decaf peppermint mocha. Skinny. Okay? Peppermint mocha iced, and it's iced. Iced coffee. But guys, to get there, right, that's point D. To get there, you need decaf grind, you need water, you need peppermint, you need chocolate chip curls, you need whipped cream, you need the sugar, right? That's how you get there. These disconnected ingredients that really don't have anything to do with that, they just make that final product in point D. That's not how the life of faith is. That's not how it is. To get Jesus, to grow in the gospel, we need Jesus, we need Jesus. Jesus isn't just point D. Jesus is point B, C, and D. Does that make sense? We need Jesus to get more Jesus, to grow in the gospel. Maybe some of us, we keep doing things and working and working on these, on these, these separate things, and all the while, it's, it's Jesus that we need. That's not how the life of faith is. Jesus is point B, C, and D. Whether we realize it or not, Jesus is the object of our desires, whether we realize it or not. But he's also the means to himself. He's also the means to himself. We need to be pursuing Jesus. Christ was crucified, resurrected for us so we could have fellowship with God and a clear path a clear and simple path to his encouragement, an accessible path to his love, an accessible path to his wisdom. Guys, if Jesus didn't die, if he didn't die and he didn't raise, rise again, we would, be, we would have no fellowship with God in our hearts. We would have empty, unredemptive encouragement. 
to latch onto. We will be we will be loosely knitted, loosely knitted in incomplete love. We would be loosely knitted in incomplete love. We would have no assurance and the treasures of God's wisdom and the knowledge would remain hidden to us. Let's pray.